It's Ready News Review with America's independent voice. As far as we know, he's going to be re-elected. Rob Ray. Barack Obama has been re-elected. I so wish that I had been able to fulfill your hopes to lead the country in a different direction. But the nation chose another leader. You know, I, I like whipping people. Do I need to whip you too? I hope not. Remain more than a collection of red states and blue states. We are and forever will be the United States of America. And together, with your help and God's grace, we will continue our journey well, forward. This is the pressing news that you need to know. I'm not concerned with what you think you need to know. I'm not concerned with what you might want reported and the way you might want it reported. Voted one of the top 10 favorite talk show hosts in America. I am interested in getting people to open up their eyes to the political system and understand that systematic change is needed and that's the only way we're going to get the change. He's the undisputed king of independent talk. It's Rob Ritten. This is Ready News Review, the show. I'm Robert Ingram, America's Independent Voice, giving you the press of news that you need to know. This is what they talk about. This is what they fear. This is Ready News Review. I'm restricted. Welcome, welcome to the program. Look, I'm going to talk about pretenders today. Hillary Clinton is a pretender. Al Sharpton is a pretender. Long Hair Don't Care is a pretender. And Steve Dam Harvey, they all related. They're all in, the, all in this together. They're all pretenders, every single one of them. And I want you to listen to me and listen to me well when I tell you this, because I, I, I'm only going to say it once. Pretender. Hillary Clinton, pretender. Al Sharpton, pretender. Steve Harvey, pretender. And I'm going to prove it. I'm going to prove it. I'm going to prove it. Listen, Al Sharpton's National Action Network had an event in New York, okay? And long hair don't care, as I like to call them, has been pretending for years to be a journalist. And he got his ass handed to him by Megyn Kelly. He's pointing, he's weaving, he's huff, he's huffing, he's puffing, and and everything else that old dry bones can do, looking like Skeletor up there. <laughs> Tells from the crib. And he is sitting up there and he let this woman run over him, run through him at his own damn National Action Network gathering. And it it, it is sad. It is sad to watch. But it is it is necessary. It is ne what is about the beat down that Al Sharpton got was worse than any national caught on tape event of police brutality that we've seen of a black man. This white woman ended Al Sharpton at his 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 own damn event. Now he's the first pretender because, like I said, there's three. I want you to listen. To Reverend Al Sharpton, talking to Megyn Kelly, here's what he had to say. A man who has found himself at the center of a number of recent controversies over race, politics, and the police, sometimes at the request of the White House. Al Sharpton heads a group known as the National Action Network, and this week they are holding a national convention in New York discussing issues that affect the African-American community and pressuring the candidates to hear their concerns. Hillary Clinton addressed the group today. Bernie Sanders will do so tomorrow. But in between the two, the Kelly file dropped in on the event to pin down Mr. Sharpton, both on his role in a series of controversies and his influence on the 2016 race for president. Watch. Now, Hillary Clinton was here today. She spoke to the group. Are you getting close to making an endorsement? Bernie's coming tomorrow. Bernie's coming tomorrow, and I'm not uh, close, but I'm not far. I mean, obviously, we're getting down the track. But I think that them coming shows that they understand that the black vote is going to be crucial, so they have to speak to all aspects of the black community. Do you feel like Hillary Clinton talked today about um, the Democrats taking the black vote for granted, right. that, they, that they better not do that? 
A, do you think they do do that? And B, do you think the black vote is up for grabs in this election, in particular with Donald Trump running, who says he's he's going to win the black vote? Well, I think that the black grant, uh, the black vote cannot be taken for granted, and how we define not taking it for granted is the issue because what we're saying is you must come with some clear concrete proposals not sound bites not just show up at our church and wave at us lay out a plan Hillary Clinton did that today to do what what are you going to do about closing the unemployment gap? We're two to one unemployed. What are you going to do about the education gap? Many people agree, even on the conservative side, that the educational inequality in this country has to be dealt with. What are you going to do in terms of dealing with the environmental conditions in our communities like a Flint, Michigan? Specifically, what kind of do you feel, general are you going to have? Do you feel like Barack Obama let you down in that department? Oh, no. I think Barack Obama did a lot more than people gave him credit. He cut black unemployment in half. He was able to, de to begin the process of letting people out of jail that started uh, becoming, in my opinion, wrongly incarcerated under the crime bill. What do you think of Donald Trump? Do you think there's a chance he might actually get a fair portion of the black vote? We ain't gonna get it straight. You know, we had Amarosa here today oh, to, yeah. to represent. From, from Apprentice. Right. And she's on his campaign, or one of the people. Armstrong Williams was here. I think they will make an appeal. I think what Donald Trump has said uh, about the president uh, with the Bertha movement, I think the calling Mexican rapist, I think the whole thing of being coy, as Hillary Clinton said today about KKK, will cost him in the black community, not just because he's Republican, but because of the things Trump has done. One thing we know is we're not likely to see another black president uh, in 2016. Uh, you know, there's no there's no black candidate running for office right now to replace Barack Obama. We might see a black vice president potentially. But what what kind of impact do you think that has on the country? Well, you know, th it's something that I said this morning uh, at the early session. We are at a place we've never been in American history. We have never seen a white president and succeed a black president. And what will that mean in black America and white America? We don't know. When we see that black family walk out across the lawn to get in the Marine helicopter for the last time, Marine One for the last time, and a white family move in, psychologically, what is that going to do? What does that mean? What will it mean about race in America? Where will we be? And I think that we need to be concerned about it, which is why during the campaign, we need to be very clear on what we're dealing with and what we're not dealing with on both sides. I remember the Republicans had an autopsy. They were going to reach out. I don't know what happened to that. I, I haven't felt... No one called you? Well, you know, Dr. Ben Carson spoke here last year, but I haven't heard from anybody this year. What do you make of that, though? Because race relations in the country are, are very poor, according to the polls. Most people believe that they've gotten worse, actually, under the last eight years, which which many folks did not expect with our first black president. Why is that? I think that because our first black president stood up and did so many things that was more in the judgment of many of us fair, people couldn't adjust. Like that, what? Well, dealing with black unemployment, dealing with the educational inequality. What do you mean? Like white people didn't like that? What do you, I don't know what you mean. I'm, I'm thinking that some of them felt that he was just taking care of, of his own community at, and by some magic at the expense of others when clearly every month for 73 months he increased job. What do you make of what's happening in this country right now with the Black Lives Matter movement? How big a factor do you think that is in the 2016 race? I think it's going to be a very big factor. They, there, there are some advocates of the, of the movement that obviously object to certain Black Lives being shot down illegally, and we've seen that in cases, uh, including I think it was South Carolina. Um, but then there are other more controversial aspects of the movement. For example, you know, the chants in this street that we've seen, pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon. What do you make of that? But I mean, you, if you study the civil rights movement from when I was a little boy, you had Martin Luther King, the tradition that we believe in, and you had people that were saying things like that back in those days that we did not believe in. And I don't think that I, you are not as responsible for people on Fox that say things you don't agree that we don't agree with. We, there was a time we used a 
lot of language. When I was young, I used the N word and called people the, the C word because I come up in the rap generation, that's where you talk. I never believed in violence. I do not believe in denigrating anyone with the N word, calling people the C word, calling police uh, pigs or anybody else. So you don't, you don't condone that kind of talk? I, I do not condone any of that, and we don't do that in National Action Network. But there are other parts of the movements that do things, and they don't condone what we do. What about the Freddie Gray case? That's been controversial down in Baltimore. That's being prosecuted under Marilyn Mosby. And she got in a bit of a bit of trouble when she came out and said, we need justice for Freddie Gray. We need justice for Freddie Gray. And, and many attorneys said, or just justice, because if justice takes us to the exoneration of the police, then that's where this case should go. Do you think she misstepped there? She said we need justice for Freddie Gray because justice for Freddie Gray was, Freddie Gray was the one that died. And justice could be whatever that leads to be, whether it ends up with criminal convictions or not. Even an acquittal of the officers, if that could be justice? If that is, in fact, if the officers deserve acquittal, if a jury finds them deserving acquittal, then that would be justice. But he's the only one dead. The one that you're looking for justice for was the one who was victimized. The victim here was clearly Freddie Gray. The question is whether what caused his death was criminal or not. Let me take you back to Ferguson, Missouri, and the case there against Officer Darren Wilson. He shot and killed Michael Brown. He said it was in self-defense, and you came out publicly and said it wasn't in self-defense, that there was no deadly threat to Officer Darren Wilson. The DOJ d found that was not correct. They could find no evidence that he was not in fear of his life and exonerated him. Do you feel bad no, about what you said? No. Don't destroy what the DOJ said. The DOJ said they did not find evidence to prosecute him on civil rights. They said there was no reason to disbelieve, no evidence to disbelieve his story he was in fear of his life. They said that he was not in violation of civil rights and that they found no evidence that he was in fear or that he was not in fear. No, no, they said there was no evidence to disprove his statement that he was in fear of his life. So we're stopping here for a moment because this is a key point and one a lot of people missed or glossed over in the hot debate after a grand jury decided not to indict Officer Darren Wilson after the DOJ came out and said they didn't have the case against him. The report from the Department of Justice specifically says the following on page 11, quote, the evidence does not support finding that Wilson was unreasonable in his fear that Michael Brown would once again attempt to harm him and gain control of his gun. And again on page 12, quote, there is no reliable evidence to disprove Officer Wilson's belief that he feared for his safety. That's from the Department of Justice. Let's pick it up again with Reverend Al. Well, first of all, if the DOJ said that, then that is contrary to what eyewitnesses and others who called us into Ferguson. Mind you, Megan, I don't... But they investigated that. I finish answering your question? I thought you asked one. When we talked to the witnesses and put them on my television show, they told us what they saw. So if I say what I believe to be the case based on talking to several witnesses, I should apologize. For what? My question is, because now I'm that's been disproven. You, but, it, but no, what has been, first of all, if you suppose that the DOJ gets new evidence and it's not disproven, I stated what I believe. When you get on TV every night, you state what you believe. To no, me. I don't. You don't? No. Well, I do. I state what I I know, because you're an opinion true. guy. I'm a journalist. Well, I'm an opinion. That's, you just answered your own question. I'm an opinion guy. Okay, but when your, your opinion is proven to be wrong by the Department of Justice, Barack Obama's Department of Justice, and a man's life is ruined. I mean, Dar Darren, Wilson, Darren Wilson has no job. He has no life. He hasn't been rehired. Make, make, Don't, do make, you bear make, some make. responsibility? If you and I talk to the same witnesses, and the DOJ talks to the same witnesses, and they don't believe them, and, and you and I do, it doesn't make us wrong it means but you don't talk to all the witnesses the DOJ does they get people in there and it can be a crime to lie to an FBI agent it's not a crime to, to lie to Reverend Al Megan calm down Whether I now watch it with calm down what, what? 
Yes. Wrong with Ask Bill O'Reilly about that. I had to lecture him on that one himself. Go by what you said. If I talk to witnesses and I believe them, DOJ may talk to more witnesses. But then you can't come and ask me to apologize for believing something that I was not privy to. Okay, so that you're just going back to the moment. But anyway, you I'm talking talk about after the fact. What after you the about fact, the moment I when said the it. DOJ comes back to you and says you're wrong, why don't you apologize at that uh, point? Apologize for believing it? For what you said, for telling the world that there was no deadly threat when there was. But I said what I believe. Did you correct the record? Did, did I correct what record? Did you go on your television program and report to the world what the DOJ had actually found? I, I, I reported what the GOG said. That About no the death record. of Michael Brown. I, I don't know that I stated the line you want, but you didn't see me out there protesting afterward, did you? Did you? <laughs> I think that's a good place to wrap. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> and now to that other story. <laughs> now, I posted the interview at the website. Of course, you need a subscription to listen and to look at the website. You need a subscription at readynewsreview.com. I posted this on readynewsreview.com because what you don't see is funny. It is funny. At the end, is because Al Sharpton takes the microphone puts it in his hand, and shoves it right back in her face. This is after pointing, spitting at her. He, he's upset. You heard him. He's upset because he's losing on Michael Brown. And I don't even know why he's trying to debate her on this issue. I don't even know why. But what comes out, and this is the pretender part, because I know you might have missed this. He said, I am not a journalist. And this is the thing that really gets in my craw because Al Sharpton has had a show on MSNBC, and, and you know what? This is the tell him why. This is the, ang this is the mad rapper. This is the angry Negro coming out of me right now. I'm just going to let you know, full disclosure, that this is the ang angry Negro coming out of me because I've been telling you that Al Sharpton is not a journalist and didn't need a show on MSNBC for years. And he sits here in this interview and he says he's not a journalist, which is why he didn't need a damn show on MSNBC and why I wasn't shedding tears when he lost his show along with a lot of other Negroes on MSNBC. Other people didn't deserve to lose their show. Al Sharpton deserved to lose his. He's pretender number one. And I'm going to tell you, pretender number two is going to sneak up on you because you don't see this one coming. I'm going to tell you Steve Harvey's a pretender too. See, I, I, I warned you about this, Negro, already. I said in previous broadcasts that Steve Harvey is not a good talk show host. He is not a good urban talk show host. He is not good at what he does. He can barely articulate a sentence. This brother sounds like he came out of, I don't know, the Chitlin Network of radio and you can't even you can't monetize anything Steve Harvey is doing on the radio the reason why like like you can with me the reason why people subscribe to my show in 24 states is because this brother doesn't have a consistent thought in his head that makes any sense or any consciousness to anybody. What is interesting is, though, they have figured out how to give him and Ricky Smiley shows because they're funny when they're not on the radio. And some people think they're funny on the radio. I don't even think they're funny on the radio. There are a lot more talented guys that are that are funny, that are out of work, that work and understand the way radio works. And he is pretender number two because of, it was funny. I woke up this morning and I read Radio Facts, Kevin Ross's Radio Facts. And Kevin Ross is riffing about the fact that, you know, Steve Harvey's on a treadmill talking about Doug Banks is his death. Now, Doug Banks is a major, major loss to radio. I, I grew up listening to Doug Banks. I didn't know Doug Banks, so I haven't made a big deal of it. I haven't been tweeting about it. I haven't been Facebooking about it. I had it on the website, but I haven't been going, you know, this is the first I've said about it. Well, the thing is, is that during the tribute, Steve Harvey is on a treadmill. I think he's doing some kind of treadmill to, in, to give him some 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 credit. I guess Steve Harvey's doing some kind of treadmill kind of, I don't know, radio thing where he maybe is trying to break a Guinness book. I don't know what he's doing. I have no idea what he's doing. But it is telling that he tells you that he's not a radio guy in this, and that's what I take from it. I, I think the treadmill is disrespectful. I agree with Kevin Ross about that. But the pretender part comes in. This Negro has made sure that people, good people in radio, don't have jobs. He is not a radio guy, and he tells you that he's a pretender, just like Al Sharp, the long-haired don't care did. Just a minute ago, Skeletor tells him the script guy, hey, hey, hey. 
Al Sharpton did, that he's been perpetrating a fraud on the radio, and the truth is not in him, and he's not a radio guy. Listen. Shirley was uh, Doug's co-host for years mm -hmm. on the Doug Banks, Banks show. Banks and Company. It was called Banks and Company. Mm -hmm. And so Shirley had a really close relationship with him. Carl has known him mm -hmm. in this business for a number of years. Sure. Tommy's met him, yeah. I'm sure. Great guy. Uh, Great. But I owe Doug Banks so much because Doug Banks was the absolute first person in Chicago to put me on radio mm -hmm. to start promoting my tour dates. And uh, when All Jokes Aside opened up years ago, I used to come on the radio to promote it. And uh, whenever I came to town performing at All Jokes Aside or when I came to town performing somewhere else, Doug Banks would allow me on the show because all I was at the point that then was, I was just on Showtime at the Apollo. Mm -hmm. The Steve Harvey show wasn't born. Mm -hmm. Steve Harvey's big time wasn't born. None of this that's going on with me now even existed. Mm -hmm. So Doug Banks really just took a guy who was on Showtime at the Apollo and put me on. And Doug Banks told me, man, do you know something, man? You could really do radio. I went, yeah, man, I don't do no radio. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and here we are today. <laughs> Doug <laughs> would go on vacation. Mm -hmm. I would come to Chicago and sit in for Doug Banks mm -hmm. for a few days at a time. And that was it. Doug Banks said, man, you could really do radio. And then Elroy Smith. Ooh. Who was the uh, program director? Program director at GCI came to me, and my first radio stint was here in Chicago on WGCI, back in the day in the in the early nineties. Oh yeah. Then the Steve Harvey Show was born from that, uh, and I left to L.A. But Doug Banks was instrumental in that. And Steve Doug Banks has always been yeah. I was going to say, I was hired to work with you on your radio show based on my work with on the Doug Banks show. <laughs> We're all yeah. like interconnected here, which is, it's, yeah, small world, so crazy. But And, and Doug is one of the guy. kindest men. What a great person. I remember when he met Wendy. Mm -hmm. I know his the wife. night he met Wendy, mm -hmm. his wife. Mm -hmm. And man, it, it's just, the brother was, If I, you, you can't find enough kind words or good things to say about Doug Banks, his worth ethic, but his heart, man, was huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, when he first lost weight, yes. how he was talking about it. Mm -hmm. You know, just every, it's so many things, man. Mm -hmm. Doug Banks was just a good brother, man. He really, really, really He's just was. a good brother. He's young, 57. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it kind of pulls you into perspective a little bit, man, when you start thinking of your life in terms of your mortality. Mm -hmm. And man, it was just, he's a good brother, man. I can't say enough about Doug Banks. What he did for me, what he taught me, mm -hmm. what he showed me, what he meant to the city of Chicago. Uh -huh. It was Tom Joyner and Doug Banks. Mm -hmm. They were Chicago radio, man. It was Tom Joyner, fly jock in the morning, and, and Doug Banks in the afternoon. And man, that was Chicago radio. Yeah. This was when radio was king of all media. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Nothing was bigger than radio, man. Mm -hmm. Especially in Nothing. Chicago. You're right. <laughs> yeah, you know, the internet mm -hmm. has changed all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, the music industry has changed because of technology. You can't sell a record no more. Too many people stealing it, pirating. They found a way to be slick, so now nobody pay for music no more. It, it's Technology's changed everything. Before all this technology was born, radio was paramount. Yeah. It was Paramount. Doug Banks was one of the great really radio was. men of our time. Yes, yes, yes he was. Hugely. Yes, he was. One of the great radio yes, men of was. our time. Mm -hmm. Make mm -hmm. no mistake about it. Mm -hmm. You can talk about me and Tom Joyner and Ricky Smiley and, and all us, but really, as far as great men, mm -hmm. Doug Banks was at the top of that pile. And I ain't saying it because he gone. He was just a good brother any damn way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't care how you shake it. Everybody at GCI and V103 up in Chicago, hearts is heavy today. Mm -hmm. Because, man, Doug was a part of that landscape before I even got on the radio. Doug Banks was doing it. 
and doing it big. Bad boy. Go ahead, Doug Banks. Thank you for being a real soldier, man. Thank you for being an example, for being a great father, for being a great husband, for being a great man. You did your thing, boy. You left a footprint real deep in the sand, man. Ain't a lot of people can go behind you. Doug Banks forever, baby. You're damn right. Doug Banks is an icon. Doug Banks is an icon. He will always be an icon. And that is the way it is. You will never, ever be a Doug Banks. Doug Banks liberated radio with syndication, okay, with boring jocks that couldn't figure it out. He unemployed boring jocks. You just unemployed jocks that are talented, Steve Harvey, just because you have a name. And there's a big difference in Doug Banks and Steve Harvey. Steve Harvey's bad radio. Doug Banks was good radio. Another pretender. And I just wish we could just shut Steve Harvey up. But that's a whole nother thing. I wish we could also shut up this other pretender. Here's the third one. This is Hillary Clinton, fresh off of the colored people joke. With de Blasio, people act like they have these, these these short memories. She's at Al Sharpton's National Action Network, and she goes off on Donald Trump. She should be going off on herself, but we'll get to that in a moment. Here is what she had to say. Despite our best efforts and our highest hopes, America's long struggle with racism is far from finished. And we are seeing that in this election. When the front runner for the Republican nomination was asked in a national television interview to disavow David Duke and other white supremacists supporting his campaign, he played coy. This is the same Donald Trump who led the insidious birther movement to delegitimize President Obama. He has called Mexican immigrants rapists and murderers. He wants to ban all Muslims from entering the United States, and the list goes on. And not to be outdone by his primary rival, Ted Cruz would treat Muslim Americans like criminals and religiously profile their neighborhoods. So ugly currents that lurked just below the surface of our politics have burst into the open. And everyone sees this bigotry for what it is. Therefore, it is up to all of us to repudiate it. Here in New York, we don't all look the same, sound the same, or worship the same. But we have learned over the years that America's problems won't be solved by building walls and dividing our country between us and them. We know our diversity is a strength, not a weakness. And New York represents the best of American values. Despite what some on the other side have said, and that we have to constantly challenge ourselves to stand up and face all that we still have to overcome the truth is not in her this is a woman that sat up there and told a negro and and blamed on de blasio after she told a joke about colored people following de blasio she told the negro in the corner look negro we're not talking about colored people time we're talking about political correctness that's what we're talking about correct political speech and I am just tired of this woman, but she is all the indicting that she has done. She needs to indict herself and her husband. Her husband has sat up there and wagged his finger at Black Lives Matter. She needs to indict Bill. I love you, people. I love you, people. You're good people. Come here, little nigger, baby. Mwah! I love you, too. All of them need to be indicted. All the Clintons for racism. He's locked more black men up and then he's going to wag his finger in the face of Black Lives Matter. It says, you should be thanking me. You should be thanking me for locking you up and my wife calling you super predators and you want to defend these super predators. This man is smoking crack. I swear to God he is. He's smoking crack in secret. You think he's the black president or was the black president. He's smoking crack. I wouldn't be surprised if they found Bill Clinton with a crack pipe and a prostitute in the middle of a dark New York alley. Let me just say, I, I, it just makes me upset. 
These people are pretenders. When this black, this black woman stands up in South Carolina and she silences this black woman for calling her in a super predator comment, that lets you know right there that she doesn't like black people. But somehow, somehow she gives a 30 minute speech about all the stuff she is going to do for black people at this conference. I want you to listen to the speech. I'm not going to deny you that, but I want to point out one thing. Barack Obama wasn't made to make one of these speeches, and Al Sharpton tells a lie when he says that he had to because Al Sharpton didn't force Barack Obama to sit up there and talk about what he was going to do for black people. As a matter of fact, when Barack Obama made a speech when he first got into office, and I talked about it, I put it in my book, Not a Nonviolent Negro, which was a bestseller on Amazon.com, I talked about how President Obama was very clear about how he would not do for black people, how he would not do for black people as it relates to unemployment, how he had to do for everybody else and how it had to be trickle down economics. And I called his ass on it and people gave me flack for calling his ass on it nationwide. And I stayed in his ass with my foot in his ass for years when I was on Sirius XM and people were upset, but I, I, I didn't care. I'm glad we're holding her feet to the fire. I'm glad Bernie Sanders is going today to talk about this. I am glad we are now getting some semblance of this is what you will do for the black community. But we should have been holding Barack Obama to the same standard. And that's the one thing I agree with Megyn Kelly about. Now, here is what Hillary Clinton had to say to the National Action Network. You know, on Monday... At a celebration of Jackie Robinson, who played his first game for the Dodgers 69 years ago this week, Reverend Sharpton said America was never the same. Well, I think it's fair to say that holds true for the National Action Network as well. And I want you to imagine what Jackie Robinson would say if he could see us now. The decades since he put down his glove have brought remarkable progress. The rise of the black middle class, the tremendous leadership of African Americans in all walks of life, from business and law to government, science, the arts, all the professions, and of course, Barack and Michelle Obama in the White House. But as you know so well, last few years also have laid bare deep fault lines in America. They revealed how afraid our bonds of trust and respect have become. Despite our best efforts and our highest hopes, America's long struggle with racism is far from finished. And we are seeing that in this election. When the front runner for the Republican nomination was asked in a national television interview to disavow David Duke and other white supremacists supporting his campaign, he played boy. Is it the same Donald Trump who led the insidious birther movement to delegitimize President Obama? He has called Mexican immigrants rapists and murderers. He wants to ban all Muslims from entering the United States, and the list goes on. And not to be outdone by his primary rival, Ted Cruz would treat Muslim Americans like criminals and religiously profile their neighborhoods. So ugly currents that lurk just below the surface of our politics have burst into the open. And everyone sees this big thing for what it is. Therefore, it is up to all of us to repudiate it. Here in New York, we don't all look the same, sound the same, or work the same. But we have learned over the years that America's problems won't be solved by building walls and dividing our country between us and them. We know our diversity is a strength, not a weakness. And New York represents the best of American values. Despite what some on the other side have said, 
and that we have to constantly challenge ourselves to stand up and face all that we still have to overcome. Now, of course, the problem goes far deeper than Donald Trump or Ted Cruz. More than a half a century after Rosa Parks sat and Dr. King marched and John Lewis fled, race still plays a significant role in determining who gets ahead in America and who gets left behind. There's something wrong, my friends, in the median wealth for black families is a tiny fraction of the median wealth for white families. When African Americans are still more likely to be denied a mortgage. Something's wrong when black kids get arrested for petty crimes, but white kids who do the same things don't. Something's wrong when gun violence is by far the leading cause of death for young black men, outstripping the next nine causes of death combined. Something's wrong when so many black parents are burying their children. Imagine if a white baby in parts of our country was twice as likely to die before her first birthday than a black baby. Imagine the outcry and the resources that would flood in to save those babies. These are not only problems of economic inequality, they are also problems of racial inequality. And it's time we face up to the reality of systemic racism in all of its forms. And once we do, we are called to come together to break down all the barriers that still hold African Americans back from fully participating in our economy and our society. And together, to build ladders of opportunity and empowerment in their place. As I have said many times, white Americans need to do a much better job Amen. of listening when African Americans talk about the seen and unseen barriers you face every day. We need to recognize our privilege and practice humility rather than assume our experiences are everyone else's experience. We need to try as best we can to walk in your shoes, to imagine what it would be like to sit down with our son or daughter and have the talk. Or if people followed us around stores, or locked their car doors when you walked past. This is a discipline that I have recognized and tried to practice in my own life ever since my Methodist youth minister took our Methodist youth fellowship groups from our nearly all-white suburb to worship the black and Latino children in Chicago and to hear Dr. King speak. And then in my first semester at law school, I met a woman named Mary Vidalman. Mary was actually here with me the last time I spoke at the National Action Network in 2007. Many of you know her story. She was the first black woman admitted to the Mississippi Bar, a lawyer for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in Jackson, a friend of Dr. King's and Robert Kennedy's before they were assassinated. Altogether, a remarkable leader. Until I met Mary, and I wasn't clear how to channel my faith and commitment to social justice to make both a living and a difference in the world. I went to work for her at the Children's Defense Fund. She sent me to her home state of South Carolina to investigate the problem of black teenagers being incarcerated in adult jails. And when I look back at everything else I've done, whether it was going undercover in Alabama as a young woman to help expose segregated academies and strip them of their tax exemptions, or running a legal clinic at the University of Arkansas to represent prison inmates and poor families, it was all part of the same mission to fight injustice and even the odds for those who have the odds stacked against them in life and in our society. 
That is true, and as First Lady, I worked with both Republicans and Democrats in Congress to create the Children's Health Insurance Program that covers 8 million children. It was true that as a senator from New York, I worked with parents and doctors and community leaders to take on the epidemic of children's asthma in Harlem and the Bronx. It was true that I worked with the organization 100 Black Men to create the Eagle Academy, a public school here in New York City, whose mission is serving young black and their community. Or when I joined partners in New York, the congressional delegation like Charlie Rangel and Greg Meeks to bring jobs and investment to underserved neighborhoods and work with leaders, including my great friend, the late Stephanie Cubs Jones, to protect voting rights. It was true when I went to David Dinkins' annual conference last April at Columbia University and gave the first policy speech of my presidential campaign about reforming our criminal justice system and ending the era of mass incarceration. So what I have tried to do, what I intend to keep doing with your help, is to refuse to accept as normal the fact that black men today are far more likely to be stopped and searched by police, charged with crime, and sentenced to longer prison terms than white men convicted of the same offenses. And we have seen the toll that takes on families torn apart by excessive incarceration and children growing up in homes shattered by prison and poverty. I don't claim to have all the answers, but I do know how important it is that we address these issues, and I applaud the National Action Network for being a champion of this cause and helping to build momentum for the cause. As your senator, I fought against racial profiling and the disparity in sentencing between crack and powder cocaine. As your president, I will work with you to make a national effort for end-to-end -end reform in our criminal justice system. And I will appoint an attorney general who will continue the courageous work of Eric Holder and Loretta Lynch to New Yorkers. Now everyone, everyone in every community benefits when there is respect for the law and when everyone is respected by the law. So we have to rebuild the bonds of trust between law enforcement and the communities they serve and stop the tragedy of black men and women being killed by police or dying in custody. Every day here in New York and all over America, there are many police officers inspiring trust and confidence, putting themselves on the line to save lives. So let's learn from those police and departments that are doing it right and apply those lessons across the country and make sure the Justice Department has the resources to hold them accountable when they do it wrong. <laughs> Reforming our criminal justice system, though, is just the beginning of our work. Over the course of my campaign, including in February at the Schomburg Center in Harlem, I've been laying out a comprehensive agenda for equity and opportunity for black communities. Mass incarceration is just one part of a broader set of interlocking challenges because years of underinvestment and neglect have hollowed out many predominantly African-American communities. There aren't enough jobs and poverty persists from generation to generation. Not enough families still today have access to the education their children deserve, the affordable housing they need to live in. Infrastructure has been allowed to crumble even if it was ever built before. A recent report found the economic impact of widespread inequality in education to be the equivalent of a permanent national recession. That's a pretty good description of what it's like to live in a community that's been repeatedly left out and left behind. 
and reports of economic recovery, which are real, because you know I don't think President Obama gets the credit he deserves for digging us out of that ditch. So I'm talking about the president of the first place. Has given us a strong foundation to go further. So now we need a truly comprehensive approach to how we lift everybody up. That's why I'm proposing a major $125 billion breaking every barrier agenda to revitalize and empower communities of color and places where unemployment and poverty remain stubbornly high. From inner cities to poor rural areas, from Appalachia to Indian country. The pillars of this agenda match many of the challenges that the National Action Network has also taken on. It has to start with a strategy to create more good jobs. So my plan devotes $20 billion specifically to help young people find work and $5 billion to help people who have paid their debt to society find jobs and support when they get out of prison. We're going to make more strategic investments in transit and infrastructure to connect black communities to areas where good paying jobs actually are. On Sunday, I was in Baltimore, where the NAACP is fighting the cancellation of a much needed rail line that would have made it easier for African Americans in low income neighborhoods to access economic opportunities in other parts of the city. They say, Transportation is a civil rights issue, and I agree. And we're going to support black entrepreneurs, especially black women who are a powerful entrepreneurial force to get the capital they need to start and grow small businesses because that's where a majority of the jobs will come from. We'll invest in education and apprenticeships. And it is outrageous that 60 plus years after Brown the Board of Education, our public schools are more segregated by race and income than they were in 1968. We have to replace the school, the prison pipeline, with a cradle to college pipeline. Because in America, every child should have a good teacher in a good school, no matter what zip code they live in. And families, families need safe, affordable places to live. Black and Latino families are disproportionately affected by the crisis of affordable housing in New York and other cities across America. That's forced thousands of people out of the neighborhoods where they've lived for years. Meanwhile, public housing is under enormous pressure. Over the past 15 years, federal funding for the New York City Housing Authority has declined by nearly 30%. So as part of our Breaking Every Barrier agenda, we're going to make affordable housing a priority. We will defend and expand the current supply of low-income housing tax credits. We'll boost funding for Section 8 vouchers and give recipients more choice in deciding where to live. And because African American home ownership has long been one of the surest ways to fund and build wealth, we'll match up to $10,000 in savings for a down payment. Now there's one more part of this agenda. If you ever ask me to be substantive, well, I'm giving it to you. <laughs> because you know what? When somebody asks for your vote, they should tell you what they're going to do, not what they want to do. And they should tell you to hold them accountable if I want you to. Because it is important that we do this together. I, I want to just talk very briefly about an issue that doesn't get enough attention. That is the challenge of in, in environmental justice. Now we all know what happened in Flint. Children yeah. drinking and bathing in toxic water for nearly two years because their governor wanted to save a little money. That's right. Parents held up bottles of brown, murky water and said something's wrong here, but their concerns were dismissed and belittled. Well, let me tell you, Flint is not alone. There are a lot of Flints across our country where children are exposed to polluted air, unhealthy water, and chemicals that can increase cancer risk. And like Flint, they tend to be places that are home to poor people and people of color. What happened to Flint when 
would never have happened in a wealthy suburb of New Orleans. It is no coincidence that black children are twice as likely as white children to suffer from asthma, three times more likely to be hospitalized, and five times more likely to die from the disease. Or that children of color are more likely than white kids to suffer lead poisoning which can lead to lifelong learning challenges and even behavioral problems. It is no coincidence that nearly half of all Latinos in the United States live in places where the air does not even meet EPA public health standards. Or that race is the single biggest factor determining whether you live near a toxic site. From Asthma Alley in the Bronx to Cancer Alley in Louisiana. And you know what? Climate change is going to make these burdens even heavier. So today I'm announcing a new plan to fight for environmental justice across America. When President Obama and I were both in the Senate, we worked together on legislation aimed at getting harmful lead out of child care facilities, classrooms, and homes with children. Now I want to set an ambitious national goal to eliminate lead as a major public threat within five years. Some say, well, that's awfully ambitious. I say, if we put our minds to it, we can get it done. Let's set that goal, and then let's get everybody moving toward achieving it. We know how to do the work. All we need is the will. And let's push polluters to pay for cleaning up hundreds of thousands of toxic sites around here. When I was in the Senate, I helped pass a law to clean up brown fields and work to bring together developers, environmentalists, and local leaders from across New York to redevelop widened properties. Let's take that work nationwide. Let's reduce air pollution and combat climate change by investing in clean energy and clean transportation. And oh, by the way, we'll put a lot of people to work. As part of our major national infrastructure strategy, let's protect health and safety by repairing not only what we can see, but what we can't, like the failing water systems, run-down public housing, and crumbling schools. Right now in the Detroit Public Schools, there are children in classrooms breathing the toxins from mold, and there are rodents sharing their space. And if, even here in New York, we know we've got problems. Let's do more like Philadelphia did when it installed green roofs and forest pavements to keep sewers from backing up in the low-income neighborhoods. Now, you don't have to look far to see what this means for people. A woman named Michelle Holmes is here with us today. She's lived in the Polo Grounds Towers in Harlem for decades. She does daily battle with roaches, vermin, and other pests. And then the chemicals used to exterminate them cause other problems. Her family has frequent asthma attacks that often land them in the hospital. And then there's the mold, brown and green spots on the bathroom ceiling. No one should have to live like that in America. Every child and every family deserves clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, and a safe and healthy place to live. This is a justice issue. It's a civil rights issue. And as president, it will be a national priority for us.
We have to demonstrate a sustained commitment to building opportunity, creating prosperity, and righting wrongs. Not just every two or four years, not just when the cameras are on and people are watching, but every single day. I have worked on these causes all my adult life. I'm going to keep going at it no matter what. And I'm going to close today by paying tribute to some extraordinary women who are here with us who inspire me every day to fight harder, work longer, and never, ever give up. You heard their names when Reverend Sharp introduced them, but I've gotten to know some of them personally and have had the great honor of spending time with them. Gwen Carr from here in New York, the mother of Eric Garner, who stopped selling your cigarettes on the street and ended up with dead. Sabrina Fulton, the mother of Trayvon Martin, shot and killed in Florida, is for walking through development where his own father lived. Valerie Bell, the mother of Sean Bell, shot and killed by police here in New York on the morning of his wedding day, and Nicole Bell, his fiance, who was married Sean that faithful day. All these women and the others who are here, the family members of those who have been lost, not only by police action, but by gun violence of any kind, anywhere. The man who killed Trayvon Martin should have never had a gun. All of these women and other family members have endured unimaginable pain. I, I look at them and wonder whether I would have been that strong and resilient. Right. Their grief is unimaginable, but they've not been broken. <coughs> Instead, they are championing their sorrow through a strategy yeah. and their mourning through belief. They are standing up. Pretenders, like I said, Hillary Clinton, Steve Harvey, 
and Al Sharpton, long hair don't care, Skeletor himself, hee hee hee, tales from the crypt, tell hee hee hee, tales from the crypt. <laughs> Guys, I've had fun, but I gotta run. If I'm not here, I'm there. There is ReadyNewsReview.com on the World Web. Rain like on the Sitting on the Dog in the Bay, baby. NewsReview.com on the World Web. Yes, this is my family knows I'm a money, which means I'm back your way after 4 p.m. with more of Ready News Review Unrestricted.